Hi there, Dr. Terry Manning here uh, from Restore PDX. Just wanted to present a case of a great outcome that we've had recently. Um, this case is a right elbow common extensor tendon partial tear, and we treated it with an adipose graft combined with PRP therapy or platelet rich plasma. This patient, the right common extensor tendon is the tendon that's usually involved with lateral elbow pain. So a lot of people will complain of, of that. Here's a little case history, especially for those who are clinicians, might find it interesting, but this was a 52 year old male presented with right lateral elbow pain. He had had this before and it was uh, treated successfully with physical therapy and rest, but uh, more recently it came back and it wasn't getting better with a lot of different conservative therapies, including physical therapy, kinesio taping, taking oral anti-inflammatories, taping, um, laser. He's pretty much threw everything at it, but it just wasn't getting better. It was mechanical pain and um, no trauma, but did have repetitive use. A uh, patient happens to own a vineyard and uh, happened to be during time where they was using his scissors to prune the grapes. Pain was seven out of 10, interfered with work and would wake him up from sleep after days of using the, the wrist in particular. No significant comorbidities. Physical exam, again, our clinician friends will find this a little more useful. Um, basically, um, I try to do a pretty thorough exam, rule out any cervicogenic involvement, and then focus in on the special tests at the elbow. And that's what we found there. It's really nice to have point of care ultrasound as um, APCA, RMSK certified uh, clinician. I've really spent a lot of time focusing and becoming expert at diagnostic ultrasound. And here's one of the advantages is that real time, I could take a look at his elbow and see if we could provide a more uh, complete uh, diagnosis for him. And so I scan the whole elbow and I have a standard protocol and these are some of the things that were negative, but uh, this is the, the pertinent finding. And so the right side of his lateral elbow, this is where he was having his symptoms. This is the lateral epicondyle. Uh, this is the radius. So this is the humerus, the bone. Here's the radiocapitellar joint. And coming over the top, basically these fibers in through here is the common extensor tendon, the tendon that's involved with lateral epicondylitis, um, most common cause of lateral elbow pain. As you can see though, the tendon not only has um, darkening in this area of the insertional fibers and a little bit of a spur here, but the, there's disruption in the tendon itself. And there's these partial tears right in through here, 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 here. So four pretty adjacent and significant partial tearing. Now partial tearing is very different than an actual tendonitis or tendinosis. In a tendonitis or tendinosis, we'd expect the tendon to be fully intact where we'd see fibers coursing through from distal to proximal and inserting on the bone, the, the collagen fibers would be completely intact, yet they would just be thicker and inflamed and there might be fluid around them. But to see the actual disruption in the tissue and disruption of the fibular pattern of the um, collagen uh, very indicative of partial tears, which requires a much different treatment than just a tendonitis or tendinosis. So this is a really great advantage of diagnostic ultrasound at the time of care is we don't, if we caught this earlier for him, you know, maybe he didn't, wouldn't have to have gone through eight months of physical therapy and yada, 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 and all these, tried all these different things. And maybe we could have gotten to the treatment a little more quickly. 
Anyway, um, another advantage of the diagnostic ultrasound at that same visit is that people have a right and a left. And so this is the right side, the symptomatic side, and I could compare it to the left side, the asymptomatic side, and just take a look and see what that side looks like. And as you can see, this is what the normal tendon is supposed to look like where it's contiguous and intact along the bone. So it's pretty striking difference between the normal side and the pathologic side. So we talked with the patient about certain uh, different treatments. One would be due to the partial tears, perhaps a referral to a surge surgeon for a surgical consult. I'm not, I'm not a surgeon, so I'm not exactly sure surgically what they may do for that, if anything. We also considered percutaneous tenotomy using a 10X device. Now, uh, percutaneous tenotomy with 10X generally is good for things like calcific tendonitis or removing of anthesophytes like that, that bony spur at the epicondyle. Definitely good for tendinosis type of picture, but when there's a, a, already a partial tear in the tendon, um, I use caution when considering that and, and generally don't recommend the 10X tenotomy. Another consideration would be an ultrasound guided cortisone injection. Now I have some really strong feelings against this because one, um, cortisone is bad for the tendon. So if we injected it into the tendon, then those partial tears could have gotten worse or possibly he could have a complete rupture of the tendon. So I told him that we weren't going to inject into the tendon. I might, I could potentially put a little bit of the cortisone um, superficial to the tendon and not into the tendon itself to get him some pain relief, but it's going to come back and it's not going to do anything to help the underlying cause of those partial tears. It's not going to help those to heal. So, um, the next therapies that we discussed were therapies that were have the potential to actually help the tendon to heal. So it's treating the root cause and, 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 and helping the body along to heal that tendon so once and for all. And so we talked through um, different types of injections that we could do that could stimulate healing. One of the most basic ones is platelet-rich plasma or PRP. Now, with PRP, PRP is great, and a couple things to consider about PRP. One is not all PRP is created equal. So if you're a patient seeking care for lateral epicondylitis and it's recommended that you have PRP, just remember that PRP from one clinic can be very different from the PRP from another clinic. And um, so do some due diligence about the research and make sure uh, your research and your clinician and just make sure that they're using a good product. How do you know if it's a good product or not? Well, one of the best ways right out of the bat is ask the clinician how much of an initial blood draw that they use to make the PRP. If they're only drawing something like 10 cc's or or around that, then it's not a highly concentrated good PRP product. It needs to be much more like 60 cc's, 120 cc's, 180 cc's, because the more blood you start with, the more concentrated you can get the platelets. And what I've seen clinically and what some most of the studies are showing is that the higher concentration that you can get the platelets, the better the outcome and healing response that you get. Now, the problem with the PRP in this case, now, uh, PRP has great evidence for treating elbow issues like lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, even ulnar collateral ligament tears and partial tears. Um, the issue that I have with the PRP is that the PRP is very fluid-like. And so when we inject it in those partial tears, yes, some of it will, will stay there and some of it will instigate a response in those um, adjacent fibers of the tear, but it doesn't really fill in the tear in and of itself. We'll talk about that with the next tissue that I recommend and or that we talk through as a treatment option. So that next tissue is um, where we take some adipose tissue from the patient 
from the love handle area, mini liposuction procedure. And then we take that to our lab and we resize it. We don't really change it at all. We just resize it so that it can fit through a needle. But basically this is called a microfragmented adipose tissue graft. And the advantage of the adipose tissue graft is that it is very viscous, it's very thick. And I often use it in these tendon ligament areas that are torn to try to bridge the two ends of it and to fill in the gap. And as we'll see from the injection coming up, you can actually see it filling in. And what that can do it then, not only does it help those gaps to fill in and approximate, but it serves as a scaffold for the new tendon to be deposited. And the adipose tissue actually has some cells in it that can differentiate into normal, healthy tendon and ligament type of tissue. The third type of what I call orthobiologic, what those of us in the field call orthobiologic grafts would be a bone marrow aspirate concentrate. So this is where we would go into a, the bone in the pelvis and pull out some of the bone marrow and then inject that into these partial tears. Now, bone marrow aspirate is a really powerful healing source and has a very uh, powerful cellular response, but it too is similar to the physical properties of the PRP. So it doesn't quite um, fill in holes in tissue quite as well as the microfragmented adipose tissue. Um, oftentimes, to get the best and most powerful response, we'll combine all three of those and put that in. For this particular patient, uh, he and I settled on using the adipose graft followed by some PRP to help stimulate the best healing response for him. So one of the issues is you can use the ultrasound to get the diagnosis, which is really helpful. And it takes quite a lot of skill and training to really know what you're looking at on the ultrasound and to make heads nor or tails of whether or not what you're seeing on the ultrasound is where a patient's problem is coming from and what is abnormal and, and or normal. So developing that skill is one aspect, but then using the ultrasound to precisely inject the medicine, whichever medicine that might be in the area where it needs to be, that's a different set of skills. So um, here is an example of me um, advancing a needle under ultrasound guidance and putting it right in the spot where one of those partial tears were. And then I'm injecting some of that adipose tissue graft into that defect. In this image, what I have done is the needle started out deep and I've walked my way up into the three or four different partial tears and made sure that they have filled in with the adipose graft. And so here's the needle tip going into kind of the final one. So that's what the injection actually looks like. Now, if somebody's injecting these things like PRP or whatever they're calling stem cells or other things like that, if they're injecting it without the ultrasound guidance, then there's no way to know that it's getting to the right tissue. And when these partial tears, that is the tissue that needs to fill in to, and to heal. And the chances of you hitting them just by palpation, by trying to feel for them and not use image guidance is very, very low. Yes, you'll probably get some of the medicine in the tendon, but it's not going to get the response. It's not going to get the full healing benefit unless you get it exactly into the part of the tendon that needs it. So that's where the ultrasound guided intervention is crucial. 
Now, another aspect of ultrasound that's great is that we can use it on the follow-ups to monitor progress. So three months post the adipose graft, the patient had zero out of 10 pain, okay, before it was seven out of 10 pain at rest, and at rest here it's zero out of 10. When he's using it, when he's doing his clippings and um, working around the farm, the worse it gets is three out of 10, which is much improved. And so he, the patient rated it as an 80% overall improvement, had increased function, was continuing with PT and meeting the milestones and ready for discharge. Now, the cool part here is that even though he's using this and exercising it and doing resistance work with PT, you can see that this, 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 and then here, the adipose graft has stayed in those partial tears. So even though he's moving this tendon and using this tendon, the graft is staying there. In this view, um, it, the graft is bright white or brighter white um, because it is more fat-like and it hasn't quite tr transitioned into normal tendon, but it's still there and it's still filling in and the patient's feeling a lot better. Another month and a half after that, uh, so 4.5 months after the treatment, we look again. Patient had improved even more over the last six weeks, zero pain daily, very occasional pain with repetitive wrist extension. But when we looked at it with the ultrasound, you could still see that the adipose graft was still persisting. And uh, here it is looking a little bit more like it's transitioning and differentiating into normal tendon. At this follow-up, the patient was just quite ecstatic and um, I didn't quite realize how important using his wrist was to him and his job and his livelihood. And he just really said that we kind of changed his life and, and really saved, um, saved his occupation and his dream of being a winemaker. So it was pretty, pretty um, nice follow-up visit to have. But we knew we weren't done yet. We want to make sure that this heals and, and once and for all. So uh, he continued to go about his, his business and um, things kept improving. And at nine months, this is what his tendon looked like. So he, he reported 95% improvement, no pain with activities. It was still continuing to feel better. But of note, the ultrasound shows that not only had the adipose graft, that brightness has gone, but instead of seeing partial tears, we're seeing a more normal uniform tendon appearance. So by comparison, this is what the original ultrasound looked like. These are the partial tears in the tendon. This is nine months post and the tendon tears have filled in, patient is feeling great. So I fully expect it to be healed and continue to be so. Um, and that is our case. And just really uh, exciting stuff where non-surgically, uh, taking some of the patient's own vital energy and healing force and healing tissues and just putting it into an area that needed it in order to, to heal fully. And this is what happened. So thanks for your time.